In this lecture we're going to start looking at sound waves. You'll see that the form of the equation for sound waves is very similar to the form of the equations for waves on the string. The primary difference is that sound waves are longitudinal waves and also when we're considering sound waves often we'll be considering them moving out through three dimensional space whereas when we con we're considering waves along a string they're confined to just that one dimension of the piece of string. This lecture is going to cover textbook section 17.1 to 17.5. First of all, a quick recap of the most important points from last lecture. We looked at standing waves. They, we saw that they had the form y is equal to 2a sine kx cos omega t. We saw that they can be split into a spatial and a temporal part and that particles that make up the medium undergo simple harmonic motion with the amplitude 2a sine kx. We saw that nodes were points on the standing wave with zero amplitude and that these were half a wavelength apart and that antinodes were points on the standing wave at which the maximum displacement occurs. These were also half a wavelength apart but offset so that the antinodes are halfway between the nodes. We saw that on the string there's boundary conditions because the string is tied at the two ends it has to have nodes at these points so this leads to a series of allowed frequencies on the string or resonance frequencies given by the natural frequencies at n over 2l root tension over mass per unit length for the string. So these are just integer multiples of the fundamental frequency, which is the frequency that it oscillates at when n is 1, when there's just one loop, and the length of the string is half a wavelength. So some properties of sound waves that you need to know. Well, they're longitudinal waves, which means that as the wave passes, the medium moves backwards and forwards in the same direction that the wave travels. They can move in three dimensions. They're not confined to one dimension, like a wave along a string. They need a medium or a material to travel through. So let's have a look at this one in a bit more detail now. Okay, now I'm going to do a demonstration to prove to you that sound does need a medium to travel through. So what I've got is a bell inside the bell jar. This is connected to a vacuum pump. In a minute, I'm going to turn on the bell and then I'll turn on the vacuum pump and I want you to listen for how loud the bell sounds through all of this. Okay, let's start. lot of the air. You can hear, still hear the bell a little bit because it is physically connected to the outside of the bell jar so that is conducting some of the sound. Let's let the air back in now and listen to the change in sound level of the bell. Noticeably louder when we let the air back in. Okay, continuing with the other properties. As sound waves travel through air, they move the molecules that make up the air, and this creates high and low pressure regions. And finally, they can be modeled as a sinusoidal wave, just the same as on a string, only remember that the displacement from equilibrium this time is in the same direction as the wave is traveling. Sound is always created by something making vibrations in the air and that vibrating air vibrates our eardrums and we hear the sound. 
So we've got some different musical instruments here and we'll see that the sound coming from them works in much the same way. So for example with this recorder, when you blow through that you'll see later in the lecture series that we set up standing waves inside. This causes the air to vibrate which if you were in the lecture theatre would go straight to your ear. In this case it goes to the microphone which then records the signal and it causes your earplugs to create that sound at the same frequency. A guitar works in much the same way. We've got strings. As the strings vibrate they're creating sound which is being resonated within the guitar body here causing those vibrations to go through the air to the microphone again. And here we've got a little drum with a little drumming monkey. And again, he's making sound by hitting his drum, causing the drum surface to vibrate. And those sound waves are traveling through the air to the microphone. So this is a an example that we'll be considering quite a lot during this lecture. We've got a tube filled with a gas and we've got a piston on the end. We can move the piston in and out, in and out, creating sound waves in that gas. The regions of maximum pressure where we've got lots of particles are called compressions and the regions with low pressure are called rare refractions. There's a wavelength between each of the compressions and also between each of the rare refractions. So to get, um, we're going to assume now that this piston is being moved in and out with simple harmonic motion. So briefly just a quick description of how the ear works. We've got the earlobe here which collects the sound and channels it into this auditory canal where the pressure differentiate differentials caused by the sound wave cause your eardrum to vibrate. This vibration is carried through these bones here to the cochlea and the cochlea is filled with a fluid and along the surface of the cochlea are little hairs that are attached to nerve endings. So when these hairs start to move due to the sound, the nerve endings detect it and send this as a signal to the brain and that is how we hear sound very briefly. So quantitatively, remember we had our piston moving in and out with simple harmonic motion. So let S of xt be the position of a small element relative to the equilibrium position. So this is talking about a little bit of gas. So S of xt, the position relative to equilibrium, is equal to S max cos kx minus omega t. So it's moving back and forth around its equilibrium position with simple harmonic motion. And we can use this to derive an expression for pressure. Just to give you a bit more of a visual of what's going on, here we've got a plot of the displacement from equilibrium versus the position. So you can see as time passes, the displacement from equilibrium changes. And down the bottom here, we've got the actual plot of where the particles can be found. So when at this point here, this particle is at equilibrium so it hasn't moved. This particle has moved a little bit to the left because it's got a negative displacement and this one's moved a little bit to the right. So they're all close to this equilibrium position. At this point here, this, the particle right here will remain right there because it hasn't moved from its equilibrium position but this particle has moved away to the right and this particle has moved away to the left. So this is where they're stretched out. So the nodes on this graph here correspond to the compressions and the rare refractions in the actual particles. So this is going to be a maximum pressure here because we've got the maximum density of particles and another maximum pressure here. So the maximum pressures actually occur when the position from equilibrium is equal to zero. But the rare refractions also occur when the distance from equilibrium is equal to zero. Okay, so now I just want you to take a minute to relate this equation for the sound waves that we've just shown to the equation that you already know for a wave traveling along a string. So just comment on any similarities and differences.